Welcome to this evening's event, everyone. It's an absolute delight to be here. I understand we have a, a very large audience. Um, I, I want to start off really by thanking Kenny Redpath and Beth Cochran of the National Library of Scotland for organising this event and for giving David Austin and I the opportunity to speak to such a wide global audience. My name is Dr. Juanita Cox. I'm the co-founder of Guyana Speaks and a research fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I'm currently working on a project, the Windrush Scandal in its transnational and Commonwealth context, but I'm interested in all things that relate to the Caribbean and in particular, the history of Guyana. I'm therefore really delighted to be able to introduce David Alston and to be given the opportunity to interview him about his book. David, uh, born and brought up in the Highlands of Scotland, is a freelance historian and author who has been a youth worker in Toxteth, Liverpool, a school teacher in Walls End, Tyneside, and in the Highlands, an adult education organiser, a museum curator, a local authority councillor, and a chair of an NHS board. His book, Slaves and Highlanders, Silenced Histories of Scotland and the Caribbean, was published by Edinburgh University Press in October, I think the 1st of October, 2021, and um, is an account of Northern Scots and slavery in the Caribbean islands and Guyana. He is among the first Scottish historians to address the issue of Scotland's involvement in slavery. Um, one quick note of housekeeping before I pose my first question to David. Um, there's gonna be an opportunity to ask questions before the end, uh, well, towards the end, maybe 15 minutes towards the end. So please leave any questions you have in the Zoom's Q&A facility. So firstly, David, welcome. Wonderful Thank you, Anita. Speaking to you today. Let's let's start by um, talking about your book. Do you, do you have an image there that you could um, share with the audience? Yes, that's that's it there. Yep, yep. Fantastic. I could also share. I could also share on 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 screen um, a picture of the book. Um, yeah, that that would be yeah. good. And so uh, wonderful. So so I'm um, just looking at that. Uh, well, let's talk about the title of the book first of all. I think um, many historians are sort of moving away from the term slaves, preferring to talk instead of enslaved Africans, sort of as a means of restoring um, their humanity. And I, I wondered, was this something you grappled over when you first considered the title? Yes, it's something I grappled over and something I still grapple with. Uh, um, and I think I'm, I'm still struggling to get it right. I'm trying to use two kinds of language and, and there's a reason for that. I'm writing primarily, I suppose, or in the first instance for a Scottish audience. And I think for a Scottish audience, we very much need to keep in, in front of our, our eyes just what slavery was. It was much more than a system of enforced labour. Uh, even a, you know, much more than a brutal system in forced labour, because what slavery claimed to do was to reduce people to objects, to property, to things, to commodities, and, and to, to trade in human beings. I think we must never lose sight of that. But at the same time, as you say, it's important that we also use language which is about the, the humanity and the personhood of the enslaved. So very often throughout the book, and, and more commonly throughout the book, I use, the, I use the term enslaved people, enslaved Africans. I think the most important thing that I can do in this regard is not simply to talk about systems of slavery and enslavement, although that's important, but also to be able to say, here is an individual, here, here is his or her name, this is what happened to them in this place at that time, and occasionally be able to say, and here is their voice. And I, I, I think that's a, that's a, that is a crucial way of, of restoring individuality and, and rec remembering the humanity of the individuals involved. Fantastic. Um... Yeah, that's, that's something that I noticed throughout the book. That's why I sort of asked the question, because I, I noticed that it, it's clearly important to you to use the word enslaved um, throughout the book. So yeah, I just thought that was an interesting thing to look at. I'm also interested in the, in the cover there. You've got um, a painting um, that's at the back, but also appears through the text on the front. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the painting? Yeah, it's a painting by, by the Guyanese artist Dudley Charles called Back Damn Fire. 
Um, and just as in the title, I talk about silence histories, like another image would be hidden histories. And in a way, that's what the cover is doing. You, you're, it's, the, the painting is masked. You're only catching a glimpse of it. But what is there to be seen, if we're prepared to, to, to remove the mask, to open our eyes, is this, I think, incredible image um, of, of vibrance, but, but also, I think, of, of, of violence. There, there's, there, there's a disturbing element in, in this history. So I'm very pleased to be able to use this image. And I hope people will, will go and, and look um, for Dudley Charles' work. Thank you for that. So um, what what do you hope is going to strike the um, reader? You know, when it's up on the bookshelf, what do you hope is going to be prompted in their minds by the title? Um, I think we still a lot of work to do in Scotland to realise that the, the, the history of enslavement is, par is part of the history of, of Scotland and of Scots. Um, I, think in, I think in Scotland, and particularly in the Highlands, I think we're behind the curve in, in this. So uh, I think it will, I, I hope that the title itself will pull people up and, and, and make them think. And, and, and I do I very much want to communicate with as wide a range of people as, as possible, because the conclusion that I, that I think I've, I've come to in, in all of this is that we have to stop talking about our story, our history. This is a shared history. Mm -hmm. um, and we only understand our own history if we understand that shared history, the shared history of Scots and the Caribbean and, and Guyana. So, um, I mean, one of the things I think is quite interesting is it's, you've done, it's really the culmination of 20 years of research. Um, I think one thing I'm interested in is were there opportunities before now to publish? Um, but also can, uh, before you sort of touch on that, can you just tell us what led you to focus on, on this aspect of Scottish history? Um, it was almost a complete accident. Um, I, I had been doing a, a doc, my doctorate part-time, which was a local study of my, my own home area, Cromarty in the north of Scotland. Uh, and I got to end of, of, of that, the PhD, and I, I had noticed one or two connections to, to the Caribbean and to, to what would have been called the West Indies. Um, it was really after I'd finished that that I, that I began to notice more connections. I, I initially, um, a couple of gravestones in Cromarty that um, had the words Demerara on it and the, and the place named Berbis. So I, I'd heard of Demerara, I'd never heard of Berbis. Um, I know, I know, I, and I know a lot, a great deal about, about Barbies, and they're, they're both now part of the Republic of Guyana. And I first thought, well, maybe this is just a little local quirk of history. And, but the more I looked at it, the more I began to realise, no, that this is the history of the Highlands, it's the history of Scotland. I've done a number of, number of um, peer-reviewed scholarly articles, but the reason for the book is the desire to communicate with a wider audience, which I, I'd also been doing over these 20 years through my website, which is also called Slaves and Highlanders. And I've, I've adopted the principle of sharing my research. So I, I haven't sort of kept things back for the book, but there is more in the book than I've been able to put on the website. And it's got a, it's got a, it, it's not, it is about the, the Caribbean as a whole, not, not just the connection with Guyana, although that's a key part of the book. Yeah, so, um... One, another thing I, I sort of was thinking about was given you've gone, you've had a sort of 20 year journey, um, have the discoveries sort of changed you as a person, changed your outlook, you know, from where were you when you started and where are you now? Yeah, I, I think it's certainly changed my outlook. I, I think it's probably changed, I think it has changed me. Um, I think the, the last couple of years have been particularly important as, as well, just coming up to the completion of the book. Um, the opportunity to hear voices from beyond the borders of Scotland, I think, has been crucial to me. Uh, and that goes back to the point I was making earlier about this being a shared history. Um, so I'll now often say to people if I'm giving talks in the Highlands that I've come to the conclusion that you don't understand the history of the Highlands unless you understand the, this history of the Highland involvement in, in, in the Caribbean. So it's hearing these voices, learning from these voices. I mean, sometimes I ask people today, but I think it's also hearing the voices from the, from the past. Um, and it is, a, I mean, it also changes me because it's a shocking history and I, I still get shocked. And in a way, I, I don't want to stop being shocked because that's the nature of, 
of, of this history. But at the same time, I, I think if we acknowledge that history and engage in dialogue um, with others, I, I, I think there's, there could be a great, a great joy in, in, in creating positive relationships where the historical relationships have, have been of this kind. Um, yeah, so um, I'm just, one of the things that, you, you know, you're talking about this shared history, and I'm thinking about the book. Um, to what extent would everyday people living in Scotland during that period of, of slavery been aware of the British pra practice of slavery overseas? I, I think they might not have been aware of what it, what it meant in practice. They would certainly have been, uh, been aware of um, I mean, during the, the 1700s, particularly mid, in the middle of that century, particularly of Jamaica. Um, so, for example, um, I mean, there's Gaelic poetry from the time, um, a Gaelic poet called uh, Rob Down Mackay, um, who, who talks about Jamaica, talks, he imagines somebody from, from his home in the north of Scotland coming, to show, coming back to the, to the north with, with enough gold to fill a flagon, a, a pot of gold. And, and that's that's the I think for a lot of people is what Jamaica means at the time a pot of gold, and then later into the 1790s, early 1800s, certainly from my part of, of Scotland, the Eastern Highlands, it's Demerara and 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 neighbouring Berbice, which are in people's imaginations. People people talk in letters about, you know, may you come back as rich as a Demerara man, and they, and they will refer to somebody as the Demerara man. And it, it's this i this idea that there there is an opportunity there. It it's a it's a it's about following the money, and and and, pe and of course lots of people don't make money, but some people do make money, and that's what people see. It's 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 the visible wealth of those who return from the Caribbean. Um, in, in 1804 in Inverness Royal Academy almost one in ten of the pupils was from the Caribbean. So you know that that, that must have been visible to people. I, th I think where it, where it begins to drop out of sight is uh, 1820s, 1830s and, and after the end of British colonial slavery I, I think there's there's a there's a much smaller black presence in the Highlands after that. And I think people people forget. Um, and I've chosen to talk about that as the silencing of history rather than amnesia, because forgetting seems a pretty lame excuse. I, I think there's something, you know, I, I think there's something more active about the way in which that 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 history disappears. Um, yeah, and I think I, I what I was thought was quite interesting as well is that there's actually an industry that's created within Inverness that's for the Caribbean. So there must have been, I think you mentioned at some point about Inverness bagging or for yes. cotton and coffee and things like that. So people would have known where it was going, presumably. Yes, yes they, they must have. In, Inverness bagging. And, and I think it's the first thing that, that, you know, has a kind of Inverness, the first thing that Inverness is known for internationally. Yes. Um, it, was, it was bagging, sacking made out of hemp, which was imported from the, from the Baltic. There, there was a, um, it, it's not a mechanised factory, but a handloom factory making bagging in Inverness, another one in Cromarty, another one in, in Invergordon. And it, it's, it's making the bags that you put cotton and coffee into. So it, it's, it's spun and the, the material spun and woven here because the labour is cheap. It's then shipped to London and it's used in the West India trade. And you can see advertisements in Guyana newspapers from the early 1800s. You know, ships arrived and it's got real Inverness bagging, they, they advertise. Uh, and you can, and you're still finding Inverness bagging in the southern United States being referred to in the 1830s, 1840s. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, people people must have known what it was being used for, and it and it was it was still being used after the end of British colonial slavery, in in the the, the economy of the southern United States. So was it was it going and coming back? I'm just thinking yeah. if, if they were sending it there, filling it with cotton and then returning it and then, you know, it comes back in the same bagging, presumably. It, um, the, well, the, co the, the cotton would come from, from get, if we take Guyana, the cotton would from, yeah. come from Guyana and then I think they would use it for packing yeah. um, any dry goods that were, that, that were going back because there's, there's um, the, one of Scotland's big exports was um, lit was linen cloth, which they called slave cloth, which was clothing for enslaved people, and um, so that that I presume would have gone in sacks and bags, um, uh, and also um, 
food for enslaved pe people was going out in the form of, of salt herring. I mean, that, that would have been in, in, in barrels. And there's a big trade in salt cod from So, so from was that being salted in um, the herring being produced in Cromarty? Uh, yes, it, yes, it would be. And when, mm. uh, so be, be, before the end of British colonial slavery, there are petitions from, from Cromarty and from Wick, which is further north and is a much bigger herring port, mm. uh, opposing the abolition of slavery. Be and then after the abolition, there are um, petitions to the, the local MP because they've lost their market and they can't find, you know, it's mm. we, the economy's in trouble because we, we've lost the West Indian market for salt herring. So all of these things must have, you know, must have been known to local people. But, but I think it's always possible, you know, with, with any kind of trade, if it's happening far away, you, you close your your eyes, you close your mind to some extent to, to the reality of what that means. Well, and I don't expect people were coming back talking about the horrors. They're more, I mean, I liked you had that, that story, story of um, Joseph Gordon with the parrot, you know, coming, yeah. uh, you know, so people would be getting maybe exotic gifts and things like yes. that, but but not, uh, probably not being told the horrors of, of slavery, I expect. Yes, I think that's right. I think I found quite a number of ex examples of parrots coming back, of uh, Amerindian art, you know, bows and arrows and you know, yeah. things, things that are, oh, and a serious sort of side to that and botanical specimens, stuffed animals, um, which are then feeding into to academic study and the creation of museums. Um, so um, when, when, the, when the museum's created in Inverness, um, one, one of the local people who's been in Burbese presents them with a, with a model of an Amerindian village. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was saying that's really interesting because we, we tend to talk nowadays of the impact of slavery on the Industrial Revolution, but we don't talk about its impact on medicine and things like that. Mm. And I think that's quite interesting as I know, um, you know, Charles Darwin was apparently taught taxidermy by somebody called, I think, Jack Edmonston. Who, John, John Edmonston, yes. John Edmonston, yes. yeah, yes. yeah, who was, who was also from Guyana. But um, yeah, I think you've sort of touched on it, but I was just going to ask, um, you know, I'm always astonished by the number of people who know practically nothing about the involvement of the Scottish in, in the transatlantic slave trade. And mm. I, I wondered how we could actually explain that level of uh, amnesia and we, we've sort of we've sort of talked about that, but is it? Can you say something? I mean, is it is it something to do with um, uh, the narrative of I don't know victims versus perpetrators? I mean, maybe it's something about just wanting to forget that side of history. I think that's a large part of it. I mean, I I, I think that um, I think after after the eighteen twenties eighteen thirties, there, there's a smaller black presence in Scotland than in than, than in some other parts of of the UK. Um, but I, th I think the main reason is that it, um, it, it, it does, it, it's, it becomes, because there is a narrative of, of Scots and particularly Highlanders as victims, it's very difficult to reconcile that with the idea that they might also have been victimised as perpetrators. Mm. Uh, and I think that still is, I think that still is a difficulty. Um, so it is, astonishing and I, I mentioned this at the beginning of the book that when the Museum of Scotland the new museum opened in 1998 there wasn't one single mention of slavery uh, that that is extraordinary uh, even at the time it was you know some some more perceptive people mm -hmm. commented on that but even more recently um, the you, you mentioned doctors I mean and um, it, Scotland provided more doctors for Britain than it was way out of proportion to the Scottish population. But a large part of what they did was to be involved in the army and in the slave plantations. And yet that's ignored um, as well. And, and it is, is still um, in the, the Surgeon's Hall Museum in Edinburgh, um, which, which has is a history of, of surgeons, of surgery, doesn't, mean, you know, doesn't deal with this. So, so there, there still are these these silences, these, these absences in, in the history that's presented. I'm just so curious because you, you you mentioned that there was a school, um, I think you're saying from 1804 to 1820 there would have been school children from the Caribbean being educated in Scotland. Were yeah. these the white children of overseers or, or plantation owners or were they mixed race? You know, they... certainly, certainly some are mixed race. I expect the majority are mixed race and they're the children of, of, of 
Scots and, and others um, um, who choose to send their children to, to school in the Highlands and either free women of colour or enslaved women. Um, and and there, there's one, um, I, I think it's quite a remarkable instance where uh, from 1817, um, plantation owners had to complete a register of slaves in which they listed everyone who was enslaved. So in 1817 in, in Guyana, there are two children who are listed in the slave register. Uh, and four years later, they're listed in the school register in Tain in the north of Scotland as, as pupils there. There's a little note in the slave register that said that says freed, but not yet manumitted. So they've been granted freedom, but the, the formal the, the legal, legal paperwork, process yeah, has not been completed. But I think, you know, the fact that you've got two children it, it, both appearing in these two contrasting registers is, is remarkable. So, there, so and every, every significant school that I've looked at in the north of Scotland for that period has got children of mixed race. Does it, does it actually register them as mixed race? I mean, does it give a name and then say, does it describe oh, them? You, only very occasionally. Uh, the In Inverness Royal Academy has, has the best set of pupil registers, but even then it doesn't always say that, it, it, but at one point it does, it, does, it does describe three brothers called McRae as black. Um, but normally you have to dig beneath the surface to work this out. Yeah. Interesting. So I know I, I know we've talked a lot about Guyana, and I just I wanted to mention that um, you do talk about Jamaica and, and Grenada, and I believe Saint Vincent. Um, mm -hmm. But the majority of the book does focus on on Guyana, and I, I was sort of interested in in finding out why Guyana in particular. I mean, why why what is why does the, it have such a big presence in the book? Well, there are two reasons. I mean, one is that it, that my part of Scotland had a particularly strong connection with Guyana, but the more important reason. Is, is because of the importance of Guyana in the history of British colonial slavery. And I think perhaps the clearest way to illustrate this, um, at, at the end of British slavery, when compensation was paid, not to the enslaved, but to the slaveholders, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a standard amount across all the British colonies. It related to what people claimed as the, as the value of the people they, they claimed to own. And, so the compensation that people got in Jamaica um, for each enslaved person they owned was less than £20. In Guyana, it was more than 50 And I think what that shows is that in 1833-34, at the end of slavery, it's in Guyana that money is still being made. Um, and there are all sorts of implications of that. It, um, so I, I think because of that, that's where the, the opposition to emancipation is strongest, where people have the strongest interest in, in getting compensation, um, where, you know, where they're petitioning either, either against abolition or, or if, if reluctantly they're saying if abolition is going to happen, there has to be full compensation. Um, but it also means at the end, of slavery, that's where there's the greatest interest in finding a new source of labour for the plantations because the plantations are still profitable. Um, and so it's where the, where the system indentured East Indian labour labor is piloted. The, 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 first, the, the first Indians who come as indentured servants to the Caribbean come to, to Guyana. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and interestingly, Guyana is, is at still at that point a very Scottish colony. Um, in 1841, there's a white population, some of whom are British born. There are more Scottish born than English born in, in Guyana at that point. And it, that, that Scottish involvement goes on. Um, so, and yet I think remarkably we, we've, in, we've forgotten about Guyana. Uh, and it, 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 so it, it, it often doesn't figure, even when people do think about um, Scotland's colonial involvement, Guyana is not to the forefront of, of their minds. So, so, so that's the main reason. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because I think most people, when they learn about slavery, generally it'll be in, in the Caribbean, it would be Jamaica that's spoken mm. about the most. But I suppose as well, part of the reason you focus on Guyana is, uh, is my understanding that in Grenada, there's the fade and rebellion, and then that sort of pushes people out yes. of Guyana into, out of Grenada into Guyana. Yeah. Yes. And, 
I mean, one of the aspects of the whole system of colonial slavery is, is that it's an environmental disaster because it's a monoculture. So there's the depletion of the soils in um, in Jamaica, in Barbados, in, in Grenada. So this opportunity of, of, of a colony on the mainland of South America um, with lots of land um, and, and, and what happens, it's, it's the coastal plantations, which are particularly fertile, and, and that's land which is in polder, it's reclaimed from the sea. Mm. Um, so, so that opportunity draws people in from, from Grenada, and you, you, can, you, can, people, you can see people following where the opportunities are. And, and it's also, it's also it, that happens just before the end of the transatlantic African slave trade. So, so Demerara and Berbice, are that that that's where the majority of of newly enslaved Africans are, are being taken to. So, Berbice is also Berbice and Demerara also are also the most African colonies, uh, in in the sense that the most of the enslaved are African born. Mm. That's that's interesting, and I I understood there's some sort of illegal trading as well that happens yeah. with with um with with Guyana I think one of the things I, I, I thought was really interesting about um well I'll say the first thing I'll say is that the, the archives in, in terms of any books I've read previously in the past have all been written from the perspective of the white planter class um and so that inevitably leads to this sort of silencing of the experiences mm -hmm. of enslaved African and distortions and maybe erasures and I, I wondered if um, you could talk to us about how you went about trying to correct those erasures and distortions. Yeah well I think that, I think it's a very exciting time for history because of the extent to which material has been digitized but also the way in which you can pull together information from a variety of sources um, it, um, means that you can begin to reconstruct at least something of the lives of individual people including enslaved people. That's one reason, but also this, the, 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 this, the, the, there is a peculiarity of the history with with Berbice, where it's also the best documented slave society in the Caribbean, um, because for for num well, for two reasons. One, because there was a system which had been inherited from from the Dutch, where enslaved people could make complaints. Now, to make a complaint, it had to be something that really mattered because you exposed yourself to retaliation from slaveholders and overseers. Yet, enslaved people did make complaints, many, many of them, and, and, and that archive is is there in in London. Um, but all, uh, but also, what has happened is that the the Netherlands have taken responsibility for digitizing the archives of the, the National Archives of Guyana up until 1815, which is when it was formally ceded to Britain. And that includes a rich source of material, uh, including court cases, including a lot of detail about a largely forgotten slave rising in 1814. And th through these sources, you can hear voices. Now, they're, they're mediated through these, these processes of formal complaints and of court proceedings, but you can still hear what is being said and I think there is something very powerful about that. Yeah so I think you're talking there about the National Archives are you with the um for the Burmese yes, in, records yeah yes yeah and I, I, one of the things I was thinking that's quite interesting about those archives and has the potential for so much you know for wider um a mm. sort of wider audience is I understood from Randy Brown actually that that they've got there are records of wives taking their husbands to court. So it's not just about slaves also taking their masters to court, um, but also all sorts of different um, permeations. Yes, you 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 begin to realise just how I mean, sla the the whole system of slavery depended on creating a hierarchy mm. among the enslaved. Um, because that was that was how you managed it. So a lot of the, a lot of the work that Randy's been doing is, is looking at the at these hierarchies and also the gender differences, the, the different experience of of, 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 of slavery of, of men and women. Um, but I, so I, I I was just going to say what I th think is interesting about that as well is my understanding is that the Dutch brought in that system as a way of sort of ameliorating slavery. Um, on the back of the 1763 Burby Slave Rebellion. I think it was right. almost 10 years before they brought it in, but it seems like um, it is unique to Burbese precisely because the Dutch brought it mm. in on the back of that, that slave rebellion, yes. which is, 
know, and the British like, continued it um, British right up continued right up to the end of to the end of colonial slavery. Right. So some of it will be in English then. Yeah, it would be what sur I, 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 what survived. I think is is in, in detail is largely the 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 British. The, the British bit, and, right. and particularly particularly from the eighteen twenties. But it's it's interesting to mm. you you can from from these from other sources get into some of some of the earlier periods. Could you um, maybe? I know there's a section in your book called a, uh, a slave called in Venice. What yeah. do you read from that? Just share yeah, a bit I think this I, I think this will help to illustrate what it is that I'm that I'm that I'm trying to do. Um, in the second chapter of the book, I look at this the the slave trade in all of its aspects. I think there's an important thing about language here. I mean, the transatlantic African slave trade came to an end in 1807. The slave trade didn't. People were still cl claiming to own Africans and their descendants and were trading in them. Um, but I, fin I, so I look at various aspects of, the, of this, not just the transatlantic trade, but the rest of the trade. And I finish that chapter by, by trying to illustrate that through an individual. So this is a section called a slave called Inverness. Tens of thousands of enslaved Africans lived and died in Berbice. What follows is an attempt to create a biography of one of them, who enters the surviving historical record on 18th July 1803, when Peter Fairbairn, manager of Lord Seaforth's plantations in Berbice, bought 20 newly arrived enslaved Africans from William Mackenzie and Company of Stabrook, Demerara. The 10 men and 10 women had all been offered to him on particularly attractive terms, a full 24 months credit. Fairbairn gave the men the names Bran, Britain, Kintail, Lewis, Gordon, Crawford, Ross, Sutherland, Dingwall, and Inverness. They were set to work on Plantation Bran under the supervision of Hector Mackenzie of Plantation Dun Robin, creating new cotton grounds by draining the coastal plantations to create polders. These were works of engineering on a colossal scale which created the coastal plantations of Guyana, initially for the production of cotton. It was not long before Inverness escaped from this backbreaking labour and by the end of the year, Fairbairn was aware, quote, of a settlement of about 50 discovered on the Demerara side of the Aberui River, about a day's journey away, with plantains, rice, tobacco, cassava, etc., in abundance, close quote. Planters use the term runaway or bush negro to refer to people like Inverness. They're more appropriately called maroons. By mid-January 1804, there had been an expedition to the bush in search of runaways, and Fairbairn heard that one of ours has been taken. Soon there was confirmation that this was Inverness, although two other Africans, Peter and Dingwall, had not been captured. Sometime after this, on one of Seaforth's other plantations, an enslaved man called Favourite was found practising obia, a catch-all term used to refer to a variety of spiritual healing and other rituals of African origin, all seen as nefarious by the white population, but in reality, part of a continuing spiritual life of the enslaved. It was believed that Favourite had also formed a plan to carry off a number of the women into the woods. He was punished by confinement in the colony barracks and then returned to Plantation Seawell, where he was again found practising obia. Fairbairn handed him over to the governor of the colony, Van Battenberg, and he was set to work in irons. Yet Favourite escaped again, and the following May, he was caught at Bran as he attempted to carry off one of the slaves. On this occasion, he had been assisted by Inverness, who had been long absent, but who it seems knows the way back and holds correspondence with the coast. Clearly Inverness had once more escaped and remained free, perhaps for a number of years. Favourite was once more imprisoned in the barracks. This coincided with a mounting concern in Berbice about the growth of a maroon camp where there were now about a hundred runaways. And the government governor came under increased pressure to mount an expedition against them. These expeditions were led by Charles Edmonston, 
a Scot from Cardrost in Bartonshire, who had been in the colony since 1780 and whose Demerara born wife was part Amerindian. He worked a timber plantation up the Demerara River and his bush expedition launched from there in 1809-10 destroyed the Maroon camp, captured about 70 runaway slaves and killed about 30. The bounty for those slaves who were killed was paid on production of a severed right hand. A list of the 70 slaves from Berbice who had been captured, re-enslaved and finally auctioned in June 1812 was later published in the Berbice Gazette. There were seven slaves belonging to Peter Fairbairn, but Inverness was not among them. And so he may have been among the 30 who were murdered, his right hand cut off to claim the bounty. Whatever his fate, Inverness was kidnapped in Africa, made into a commodity called the slave, suffered the horrors of the Middle Passage, was sold, renamed, set to backbreaking work on the fever-ridden coast of Guyana, escaped more than once, lived free again, was captured and finally died or was killed almost entirely by Scots, many of them from the Highlands. Thank you for that, um, David. I think it's a, a really interesting passage because although He's clearly been enslaved. He's also resisting that slavery. Mm. He's refusing the status that he's he's been given the whole way through. Yes. Um, one thing I'd I'd love you to be able to do now that we 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 sort of looked at the life of um, what we what we could find out about Inverness <clears throat> is I wonder if you could give us some examples of how um, success changed the long term future of Scottish families. You know, so maybe somebody like Donald Mackay. Mackay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Donald Mackay is a, a, a boy from Inverness, and these are these are these are boys. You know, they're they're often going there when they're sixteen, seventeen. Um, Donald's got a reasonable education, but he doesn't have much else. He's got a letter of recommendation from the province of Inverness, and he goes out and he gets a job as a clerk in Mackenzie and Company that I mentioned in in a bit of Inverness, mm -hmm. um, and they help to provide him. They they give him credit to so he can buy his own enslaved people. Um, and he gradually builds up his holding of slaves, of enslaved labourers. And this is because this is before 1807, before the end of the transatlantic trade, he's able to do so. He goes from there to, um, to acquiring a plantation and he's able to, to come back and, and he retires. He, he ends his life as a country gentleman in, in England. Um, so there, there are examples of that, um, of, of people who, who can, who do, it's not quite rags to riches, but it's from a very modest beginning. Mm -hmm. um, he, he is begging letters from his relations. So some of his relations in Inverness are, 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 are certainly on the edge of poverty, if not in poverty. And he's come from that background to, to a landed estate state in England. So okay. there are examples of that. He, he does that within 10 years or so, doesn't he? Uh, well, it's about, it's about 20, it's probably nearer to 20 years by the time he, he gets back. But yeah, right. he's, um, so there, there are examples like that. There, there are examples, there are examples within the Highlands. Also people are, you know, do that in a, on, a, on a much more modest scale. Mm. Um, there's a house in Cromarty where I live that was either built or renovated by somebody who, who was a carpenter who'd gone out. Um, and being a carpenter meant you had enslaved workers who you trained as carpenters. So you had enslaved carpenters that, that you run as a gang. Mm. And when he was leaving, um, that gang of 10 enslaved carpenters was offered for sale. And they had, mm. the advertisement appeared in the Demerara newspaper. So you, you can see that, then he's, then he's back, in, back in Cromarty. His house is still there. Um, and in, I think is a bit of an irony for Highland history, his son, later became one of the first crofters commissioners um, established later in, in when the crofting commission was established later in the century. I think that's quite interesting actually because I think most people have this idea that slaves were pretty much bound to plantations but actually people could have shares in a slave and hire them out for all sorts of different purposes and I, I suppose even um, when you talk about Donald Mackay when he initially got his slaves he was probably just hiring them out before he, he got a plantation. 
Yes, and he had a friend from Inverness who was running that TAS, a TAS gang. I mean, TAS gang it sometimes refers just to a gang within, within the plantation, but it can refer to, to a mobile gang like that, which is, um, which is, which is very often you know, mostly men. There'll perhaps be one or two women who are, who are, who are there to, I, to cook, I suppose, you know, um, but, but it's, a it's a very harsh existence, the, the, the TAS gangs. Maybe less so where they're, they're skilled, like the carpenters, but it, some of the worst conditions are probably in, in TAS gangs. So, um, just, so we spoke just a little bit in terms of um, David Mackay that's talking about an individual. What would you say was the impact on, Sc on the Scottish economy? Um, I think there's a huge amount of work still to be done on this. Um, um, I, I suppose, concentrate more on, on the micro history, on, on the individuals. Um, it certainly has a big effect, but, I, but, it, but putting a figure on that is not something that I can do. And I think there's a lot of work to be done, but it has a big, we can see, we can see it not just in people who come back with money, who, 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 who buy estates, but in, in Scottish industry, the cotton that is the raw material for the cotton industry, which is the way in which the industrial revolution begins in Scotland, the export of, of linen slave cloth, which is one of Scotland's principal exports um, in, in, in the late 1700s. So in all these in all these ways, it is a profound impact on, on the Scottish economy. But I think there's a lot to be done on, on quantifying that. But I think it's still interesting. You can think of uh, as well in terms of banks, um, mm. insurance businesses and things. I mean, it's it's. It must have. Yeah. Um, been disseminated out in all, all parts of all parts of the economy. Yes. Um, but yeah, how you quantify yeah. that at the moment, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right to mention banks and insurance yeah. and, and shipping because these um, that's this, the whole system of enslavement and, and the produce produced by enslaved labor re mm -hmm. requires complex um, systems of credit which develop I think in in there and, and then are, are later available for the industri for the industrial revolution I, I think it, I think one perhaps comes from the other yeah. as do systems of management and accounting systems of and, um, one of Scotland's contributions to the, the the plantation economies are accounting systems yeah. um, the, the the standard the standard textbook of accounting uh, John by by Scott John Mayer which ran into count, sorry, a number of editions over fifty years had had specific chapters on running a tobacco plantation a sugar plantation um, so like accounting and um, accounting and slavery are, are close and management systems are closely connected. So interesting. So I, um, I mean, one of the things I think you, you do really brilliantly in the book is this kind of lots of different um, micro histories that show us sort of a nuanced story of slavery because it focus on, focuses on a wide range of individuals um, whose endeavours, I guess, lead to very different outcomes. Um, so, you know, not every Scotsman was successful. You know, mm. you, we, we hear the stories of people who either died from yellow fever or drowned or whatever. But um, it was also interesting to see that you wrote about freed people of color and, and their sort of experience within the plantation economy. And I'm wondering if you could, you could tell the audience a bit about Doll Thomas. Yeah, Doll, Doll Thomas is a remarkable woman. And I will use the language of the time because it is how Doll Thomas would have identified herself. She would have called herself a free coloured woman. And, and, and in, in, in using that term, she would have been distinguishing herself from the very small number of free black women in the colony and from, and from enslaved women. Um, she is a remarkable character who, who uses, she's, she's the she's probably the richest woman in, in Demerara in the 1820s, 1830s. She is a, a slaveholder herself, uh, but she's one of the, f the few people who, who appears in Britain, in both London and in Scotland. There's a, a description of her in the, in the, the early, in the, in the 18, early 1800s, um, a merchant called Charles, Charles Parker, who's a, a, a very important merchant, says, writing to somebody else says who do you think is, is here in Glasgow but Doll Thomas and her 19 children and grandchildren home for education so she brings her she makes sure her children get, get education in, in Scotland 
Um, she, I'm not quite sure what the right word is, she, she ensures, she manoeuvres her daughters into relationships with prominent white planters, mostly Scots. Um, one of her daughters is, um, is back in is back in Scotland. She is married or, or claims to be married um, to, um, to a, a Colonel Gordon who's from, from Sutherland, again, you know, close to where, where I am. Um, she is a, she's a powerful woman um, and there are, there are contemporary descriptions of her. She, 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 she certainly, she was in London um, in, the, in the 1820s and she'd come to London to have a tax removed, a tax that had been specifically imposed on, on free coloured women, uh, not on free coloured men because they had to serve in the militia. So the tax was just on, on the women who ran businesses. And whatever actually, she got the tax removed, and whatever actually happened, she, she, when she got back, let it be known uh, or told the story that she had hired a coach and horses and had arrived at St. James's Palace and had emerged with, dressed in a turban studded with diamonds and an ostrich feather, um, a necklace of gold doubloons and a skirt made of five pound notes of the Bank of British Guyana sewn together and demanded to see the foreign secretary. And, and she made such an impression, um, however, however she did do it, that she, that she got in and she, she did get the tax removed. And at other points, she claimed to have danced with King George um, um, I, I, uh, when he, uh, or, or, with, uh, or with King William when he, when he had been in the, been in the Navy. So she, a remarkable. She, um, she earned the title of the Queen of Demerara as yeah. a result of that. Mm, mm. <laughs> I always, I, I think she's almost like an opera Winfrey of her her generation. <laughs> Seems yes. so. And it, it's interesting as well because she she also owns her own slaves. I think she has something like twelve slaves of her own, or oh, seventy slaves of her own. How many? Sixty or sixty or seventy. Really? Oh goodness! Yeah. I missed that. So, but most of them were women that she hired out as hucksters, I suppose, or yes. market women, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, and interesting too because she she bought her own mother. Is is that yes. Right? <laughs> I yeah. mean, this is one of the things that free, free women of colour were doing. They, um, they, would, there was, they, would, they would free their relatives. Um, and you, you can see this with other women. And one of the odd things that, that Doll Thomas is also doing, she, she has enslaved men who are porters, enslaved younger women who are, who are hucksters. But she also has um, a number of slaves who, who are recorded as being in their 80s or 90s. Mm. Um, and I wonder if these are also relations uh, to, to free somebody cost a lot of money and there was probably no yeah. advantage to these women in being freed at that age if they had a secure place to live so I think there might be a bit of an ambiguity about at least some of her uh, some of them slaves. It, that's certainly the impression I got because I thought you know if you're going to buy your own mother it's actually more to do with protecting her from being bought by or abused by somebody yeah. else yeah you know so be, it would be interesting to hear if there's more research that comes out on that mm -hmm. side of things I'm conscious that um, it's, it's what, 10 minutes to six. I, there's yeah. one question I really wanted to ask you. Um, you actually went to um, Guyana as part of your research. And um, I wanted to know, what was the effect of that trip on your understanding of the interconnections between Scotland and the Caribbean? It had a big effect on me. I went, I went in early 2020, fortunately, just before, before COVID. I um, mean, it's there. It is no matter how much you know in your head. There is something different about standing on the ground and just getting that sense of the scale of of, of all of this. Mm -hmm. um, but also meeting people. Um, there was one um, one of the places we wanted. I, I went with a colleague who's got similar interests, Michael Hopcroft. Um, and one of the places we wanted to get wanted to get to was Plantation Belladrum. Uh, a lot of people in Scotland will know Belladrum in the Highlands because of the, the Belladrum Music Festival, um, which will probably start again ne next year. And uh, we wanted to get to Belladrum in in Berbice. Um, and we we'd hired we had a car, so we were able to get part way down off the main road onto the sand roads. But then we had to walk, and there, there was somebody. We, 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 he, he would have called, he called himself a farmer, we would call him a market gardener, who was on the other side of the, the drainage canal in, in the next, what would, what would have been the next plantation, and he showed us the way down, down to the shore. His name, was, his name was Keith, Scottish name. And then he, he broke into, uh, for, for about five minutes, a praise of farming. Um, 
which was structured around the 10 verses of the 24th Psalm. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all its peoples. And, and this was his, his own thoughts, but using that as the structure about the importance of farming, the importance of the earth, the importance of a right relationship with the earth and with other people. Um, and in a way it can, you know, you think of the importance of the Psalms to, in, to Scotland and to Scottish history, in a way it couldn't be more Scottish. <laughs> yeah. And so there was, there was something about, about that connection that really, that really moved me. And, in, you know, in the light of, 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 of the climate crisis, you know, what, what Keith was saying about relationship with the earth was, was moving and, and significant as well. I think it's worth mentioning as um, for, for people who've never been to Guyana and who do live in the Highlands, it's worth mentioning that the place names are also mm. mirrored. So you would have come across many places in, 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 in Guyana that, you know, yeah. sounded like you, you were still in the Highlands. And the same with people's surnames. You know, there's many phrases of McPherson's and, you know, McDavid's, all sorts of different names that can be clearly traced back to um, mm. Scotland. Mm. But, um, yeah, and also just, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, when I when I was thinking about the, you know, because it's worth mentioning, Guyana's below sea level. So yes. you're having to build up sea defences, mm -hmm. you're having to um, build, uh, dig out drainage canals. I saw a figure somewhere, something like 100 million tonnes of mud. <laughs> well, yes, I, I reckon... Um, I won't go into details of the ca calculation, but because they were happening about the same time, I think that you know, the work that's carried out in Guyana to create these these plantations entirely with the labour of enslaved Africans is was, was the equivalent of digging three hundred Caledonian canals, wow. and they had a steam dredger to help with the Caledonian canal. That's phenomenal. Um, Right, well, so I, so I don't take too much more of your time. Um, this is a final question, and I'm just going to ask you to do a reading. Your, your, a, a, a reading, um, I think it's in the afterword. But I, I just wanted to say that you start the book um, with a chapter called Jumbies, which is the Creole world, word in Guyana for, for ghosts. And you end the book with an afterword called Ghosts in Our Blood. And I'm just wondering if you can expand on why the idea of ghosts was both your starting and finishing point. Um, I think because for 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 me, it, it it you know this began with with figures that seemed to be only just sort of half glimpsed, that, that, you know, that maybe maybe weren't real. But I mean, the more I went on, the more I discovered that they were very real. But also that I had in my mind a particular ghost story, um, which is which is a story that that. I didn't read in a book, I heard it growing up. It's a story um, from a place called Nig, which is just over the water from Cromarty, the story of the White Lady of Bayfield. Mm. The story of the White Lady of Bayfield, the White Lady of Bayfield was a woman called Arabella Phipps, who was married to somebody of Hugh Rose, who was a plantation owner, who'd made his money in the Caribbean. Arabella Phipps is the White Lady of Bayfield, and she's supposed to have been stabbed by the black woman who had been brought back by her husband and who was kept in uh, you know, either as a house servant or as a mistress in the attics of, of Bayfield House. I have no idea when that story first started being told and it's obviously a bit like Jane Eyre and Rochester, but there was there was a there was quite a spooky similarity between that. And what I say in the book is that I actually think that it's the Black Lady of Bayfield that's a more interesting character, and that we we need to get her out of the attics and understand what was going on. That's interesting. So um, yeah, could you could you please read, you, read the bit from your afterward? Okay, I'll 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 just read a, sh a short bit from from the after afterwards, and I be I begin the book with the with an account of a knife fight in the in the school in Cromarty in 1818 when somebody called Hugh Miller, who will be familiar to to some of the audience, uh, had had a fight with a black teenager. I began this book with an account of an incident in my hometown of Cromarty, in which more than 200 years ago, a white teenager named Hugh Miller fought with and stabbed an older black student outside the local school. While they fought here in 1818, a number of men from Cromarty were engaged in or were recently returned from the oppression of thousands of Africans and their descendants on the coast of Guyana. And I then say something about the creation of the, of the Guyanese plantations and the scale of that work. There was another Cromarty, 
a plantation created on the coast between the Berbice and Corentine rivers, which was what, but one part of that vast enterprise. In 1818, it held in bondage 74 enslaved men, women and children. 52 of them had endured the Middle Passage from Africa. They were about 52 among more than 7 million who survived that horror. And I'm talking about the, the, the North, um, the, the trade to the Caribbean. And 20 of those enslaved on plantation Cromarty had been born in slavery in Berbice. The oldest, a 16 year old girl named Suki who worked in the cotton fields. She was the same age as Hugh Miller in Cromarty. Just as the Caledonian Canal is dwarfed by the scale of the works which engineered the landscape of Guyana. And just as plantation Cromarty was but a tiny part of the plantation systems of the Caribbean and North America. So the magnitude of human suffering and death in the regimes of chattel slavery exceed any of the sorrows of Highland history. It is important to remember this not least because slavery stole the identities and the voices of its victims and consigned them to the great silence. Only occasionally, and often with difficulty, can we hear these voices. Thank you for that, David.